really a privilege to be with you all tonight. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how large this crowd was going to be, and I can tell you that the last time I was in front of a group like this, uh, it wasn't a good news story. Uh, so wonderful to be here. Um, Admiral Miller, Captain Clark, a mentor and friend, great to see you here again, sir. Uh, Mr. Ortiz, uh, all our distinguished guests, and uh, most of all, Mrs. Lawrence, who I know, and, and she is indeed a national treasure, someone who mended the knee of one American hero and mended the heart of another. A pretty amazing story, and we feel very grateful to be here, and it's been wonderful to have uh, you in our lives as well. So thank you for uh, being here tonight. It's really a privilege. And it is indeed the eve of my 20th reunion coming up this weekend uh, from the Naval Academy. And when you've been away for a few years, a few decades, you really marvel at how things come full circle. To see our future leaders, you know, future leaders like Midshipman Lusty and Midshipman Roberts over there, uh, interact and mingle with our current leadership, uh, the superintendent and uh, the commandant and what a great leadership team they're gonna be. You really marvel at how things come full circle. And we also remember past heroes, past heroes like Admiral Lawrence, uh, someone whose shadow uh, still shades this school. And Admiral Stockdale, I'll mention him as well. It reminds you that this is a very special place. And those two heroes are really linked forever, not just by this school, but by the crucible of Vietnam. And while every prisoner of war story was unique, these men really do leave a particularly remarkable legacy. Admiral Lawrence, uh, brigade commander, member of the class of 51, helped bring about our honor concept, the one that we still follow today. And he's a man that a future chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff would call the most gifted naval officer of his generation. And Admiral Stockdale, class of 47, someone close to my heart since I was the first CO of a ship named in his honor, was a gifted intellect and leader, future best-selling author with his wife, Sybil, who I know and admire very much, and would go on to earn the Medal of Honor. But really, it was when these two men were stripped bare of the achievements and trappings that the modern world perhaps holds a little too dear that we really saw the essence of their true character, and that was in North Vietnam. And after they returned home, uh, they continued their legacy. They touched thousands of lives, naval officers, midshipmen, American citizens, with their wisdom, their leadership, and not insignificantly, their ethical example. They're also linked how we honor them. As I said, there are two statues, both cast shadows on the yard now this evening, and I was able to make one of the dedications in 2008. And they have two destroyers that proudly bear their name, and I know Lawrence will soon be joining the line, and we're very thrilled about that as well. But most of all, we can honor them by living up to their example. And having spent time with both men and both families, I really wish they were here tonight, because I think 10 minutes with them, with those two men, uh, would probably teach us a little bit more about ethical leadership than many of the books that purport to be about that subject. But unfortunately, tonight, you're stuck with me. And unlike these two extraordinary men, I'm neither an ethics expert, and I'm certainly not a hero. Frankly, um, in my life, the biggest tests have chosen me, not the other way around. And as a midshipman, and there's a couple upperclassmen who remember me and are in the audience tonight, they can probably attest to this, I was pretty ordinary. In fact, a few upperclass would probably say that Kater was a little less than ordinary. I couldn't march. I may have been the worst sailing student in the history of the Naval Academy and I walked a few tours on Red Beach as well. I was, I was ranked second to the last at the end of plebe summer, and the guy behind me quit. I, I'm not kidding. It's a true story. So I eventually figured it out and did okay, and uh, one of my real privileges was as a first class mid, being the uh, gent charged with teaching a new plebe class, then the class of 93, to you younger folks, I know that makes me feel, sound really old, but to teach them about our honor concept. But when I reflect back on my time here, uh, it's actually tinged with a little bit of regret for not always being my best. And don't get me wrong, I tried to be my best most of the time. I tried to do the right thing most of the time. 
But really that's not enough because ethics isn't a sometimes thing. It's what you gotta strive to get right every day. But even when I wasn't always listening, the Naval Academy frankly drove this home, teaching me more about loyalty, not giving up, and making the right decisions under pressure than I probably cared to learn. And it wasn't easy. It's not supposed to be, right? The Naval Academy also forced me to confront my limitations. We were talking about this, uh, Midshipman Lusty and I were talking about this a little earlier, more than any other time in my life. And I suspect anybody who's walked through these gates can envision their own brick wall. I see a few smiles in the audience. Things like double E, 10 meter tower jumps, although I know that's kind of changing. Uh, <laughs> heard that's a big deal around here. Um, not that relevant, frankly, for all that we do out in the fleet, so I wouldn't get too excited about it. Uh, plebe English, or maybe just a really angry second class with really bad breath who waits for you every morning. But we all have those little brick walls. But through it all, my classmates and I learned what it was like to fail, what it was like to be found wanting, but most importantly, how to bounce back and win as a team. And really, it's when you're stretched, it's when you're challenged, that's really when you start to take a measure of your ability to make decisions ethically. Because if we're good at everything and we succeed in everything, it's pretty easy to get, get things right. But that's really where we were tested. And simply put, I was no Stockdale, and I was certainly no Lawrence, but someone who fell short occasionally, cut corners at times, and often worried too much about what others thought instead of doing the right thing. And it's from this perspective that I'd like to share a few observations on ethics beyond the Naval Academy. After 20 years outside these gates, after 10 duty stations, six ships, and leading by now thousands of sailors, I found that it's those everyday ethic decisions, not the life-altering ones that occur once or twice in a lifetime, that define most of us. These are these day-to-day -day trials that if they're handled poorly, can erode your moral landscape and lead to larger ethical lapses. And so while I deeply appreciate the intellectual rigor of folks like Kant and Rawls and the Stoics, um, we're not gonna talk about them and there's gonna be no Greek philosophers quoted tonight. Um, what I wanna talk about is ethics as plainly as I can and to share with you an approach that I have found works in the fleet and I'd like to think life. And this is the same advice I would give my little brother my best friend, and it's the same advice I gave my officers in my wardroom and my young sailors as well. Three points. First, don't ever ignore that little voice inside your head. Second, be your best in all things at all times. Finally, be ready to do the right thing every day. Don't ignore that little voice. That little voice represents many things. Your education, your instinct, the things your mom and dad taught you, things you learned in church or synagogue, what you learned here. And even when you've forgotten those lessons, that little voice remembers. And bluntly, if you spend more than 10 seconds trying to convince that little voice why something that you're considering doing that you know is shady is worth doing, it's time to take note. And I'd like to share with you one time when I did not listen to my little voice. And it was one that my mom was kind enough to remind me of uh, when I told her that I was going to come up and give this speech. One thing I've learned is after 20 years, you learn that moms and wives, they don't forget. <laughs> so the day my class climbed Herndon, I decided I was going to wear civilian clothes in town. At the time, the privilege was not extended to underclassmen, but I sort of felt that rule was optional and unnecessary. And being the bright guy that I was, I chose to demonstrate my independence at the place with the single greatest concentration of upperclassmen in the state of Maryland. Okay, for us it was the Annapolis Mall. I don't know if it's the same, same for you all. So as I finished dinner there, probably full and full of myself, out of the corner of my eye, I spotted the toughest upper class in my company, a company that had led the brigade in plebe attrition. So I quickly went into escape and evade mode. I left my parents in the dust, just as my mom was remarking about how pale I had suddenly started to become. So eight hours later, I'm standing a previously scheduled mid-watch, and that same tough midshipman comes rolling in the company area. Head down, he muttered a greeting to me, I greeted him back, and then he gave me the biggest double take I've ever seen. And then he just walked off. 
And I don't know if he ever saw me or not. You know, he didn't ask, and I didn't tell. And while that was not the greatest moral failing in the history of the Naval Academy, uh, it demonstrates...